Hello my friends. And welcome. This time I am going to be telling you the story, about the female convicts, who were sent to Australia. Transported to a distant land, for crimes of poverty. Australia's female convicts were charged with the task to tame, and have children with the convict men. After a harrowing six-month voyage across the sea, to the newly established British colony dubbed New Holland, the women were either sold off for as little as the price of a bottle of rum, or, if sent to Tasmania, then known as Van Diemen's Land, they were marched to the Cascades, female factory, a damp distillery come prison. Yet, despite their harsh treatment and dark experiences, the story of Australia's convict women, is ultimately one of triumph. It is estimated that 164,000 convicts were shipped from Britain and Ireland to Australia, between 1788 and 1868, under the British government's new Transportation Act. The exact origin of the use of transportation as a punishment for crime is obscure, but it seems to have developed in the 16th and 17th centuries from a need to avoid what were considered the destabilizing influences of particular groups within society. During the course of the 18th century, the death penalty came to be regarded as too severe for certain capital offenses, so transportation to North America became popular as a means of mitigating the sentence. Except for profoundly serious offenses, transportation came to largely replace capital punishment. After the American War of Independence, New South Wales replaced North America as a penal colony, and capital punishment was largely replaced by a sentence of transportation. Penal transportation from Ireland to Australia, and later to Bermuda and Gibraltar, covered the years 1791, until 1853 when the sentence of penal transportation was commuted to a prison sentence in Ireland. When a transportation sentence was handed down, the prisoner was normally returned to the local jail. Southern prisoners were housed in the city jail at Cork. It was constantly overcrowded, and in a shocking state of decay. Prisoners brought to Dublin were mostly placed in Newgate and Kilmainham jails. Newgate was in a deplorable condition. From 1817, a holding prison was provided in Cork, to house the convicts. In 1836 a depot was provided in Dublin, for female prisoners, who had not been segregated prior to this. Temporary depots were opened, prior to the opening of Mountjoy Prison, at Smithfield, Dublin, and Spike Island, in Cork Harbour, for the male prisoners. These prisoners often had to wait for periods of up to two years, before they were actually transported to Australia. New South Wales alone was favoured for the reception of the Irish. It was noted that the Irish were sent almost exclusively to New South Wales. No less than one third of the total population of the colony were convicts, or emancipated prisoners. The probation system, instituted in 1840, replaced the assignment system, and provided for the settlement of prisoners at a number of probation stations, particularly in Van Diemen's Land, now known as the state of Tasmania. The probation system consisted of five stages, of which the first was detention at Norfolk Island. No one other than convicts, penal officials and the military detachment were allowed to live on Norfolk Island. The convicts were employed doing hard labor for usually two to four years, depending on their sentence and behavior. The next stage of probation was the probation gang. The term to be spent in this gang depended on the original sentence, according to scale. While some prisoners got seven to ten years transportation, or two years probation, some got transportation for life, or four years probation. Once prisoners had passed through the probation gang, they proceeded to the third stage of punishment, during which they became eligible for a pass, which, enabled them to work privately for wages. The fourth stage was ticket of leave. This was only after they had served half of their original sentence. 
The fifth stage was a pardon, either conditional or absolute. These could be granted by the Queen, or by the Governor. This probation system did not work, as more workers were needed for agricultural purposes, as opposed to road gangs or tree felling. The government also could not afford to employ the convicts on the terms laid down. The importance of the convicts to Australia's development cannot be taken lightly. These prisoners and their children numerically dominated the country from the first settlement in 1788 to the 1820s. They formed the Great Labour Force, which laid the foundations of Australia prior to the gold rushes of the 1850s. Approximately 25,000 of these convicts were women, charged with petty crimes such as stealing bread. Half the women landed in mainland Australia and half in Tasmania. Less than 2% were violent felons. For crimes of poverty, they were typically sentenced to six months inside Kilmainham Prison, in Dublin or Newgate Jail in London, a six-month sea journey, seven to ten years hard labour and exile for life. Clearly, the scope of their punishments far exceeded the scope of their transgressions. According to detailed ship journals, most of the female convicts had never even travelled on a rowboat, let alone a large ship before, so most experienced extreme seasickness during the voyage. The women were housed on the all-up deck, the lowest and the smelliest where they slept on wooden bunks, that measured 18 inches wide. Prior to their voyage to Australia, most of the women were incarcerated at Newgate Prison in London, which was often referred to as, the prototype of hell. It was here that the women came into contact with Elizabeth Gurney Fry, the first internationally known female social reformer. Elizabeth gained the nickname the Angel of Prisons for her work with female inmates at Newgate, who she regularly visited for over three decades. Inside Newgate, Elizabeth set up a schoolroom, where children imprisoned with their mothers could learn to read and write. She also taught the female convicts how to sew, so that they would have a skill once freed in Australia. As they boarded the transport ships, Elizabeth and her volunteers gave each woman a bag that contained scraps of cloth, needles, and thread. Aboard ship the women could make a quilt which could later be sold in Australia, for a few coins each. Only one of these quilts, which has survived the test of time, the Raji quilt, named for the ship aboard which the women prisoners and the materials for the quilt, arrived in Hobart in 1841, and is now on display at the National Museum of Australia, in Canberra. Records of the lives of convict women living in Tasmania, are well preserved while those documenting the lives of their counterparts in Sydney have been destroyed. According to the New South Wales government many of the records were ordered to be destroyed by the military because they had no use. However some 20th century reports have led people to believe that records may have been destroyed by convict descendants, eager to wipe their past clean. Based on arrest records, court transcripts, description lists, ships journals and newspaper accounts, available to us, we are able to create an accurate picture of Tasmanian women's day-to-day -day lives. The newspapers in Van Diemen's Land reported colourful escapades like the first female flash mob in 1840. They were known to sing and dance naked under a full moon. And when it came to meeting their future partners, they were highly creative. At the Cascades Female Factory, one of the many rules was that the women were not allowed to speak to men. To find a way to communicate with prospective lovers, the women devised a scheme whereby they smuggled love letters inside chickens that were delivered to a corrupt warden. Today, the Cascades Female Factory, located in Hobart, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and regularly holds exhibitions on the lives of the convict women housed there. The Transportation Act had a very clear economic motive. The British wanted to beat the French to colonize Australia, because it was rich in timber and flax. It was also social engineering in that the British government wanted to remove the unsightly poor from their own streets. 
The convict men were transported first and soon outnumbered women 9 to 1 in Australia. You can't have a colony without women so the female convicts were specifically targeted by the British government as tamers and breeders. Countless stories that exemplify the human spirit. They were ordinary women who found the courage to become extraordinary because they had no other choice. We can be particularly taken by the story of 12-year-old Agnes Macmillan, who was transported to Australia for stealing stockings. Agnes Macmillan was left to fend for herself. Her story centers on how human beings find hope where none has the right to exist. Her best friend and surrogate big sister Janet Houston was transported and imprisoned with Agnes. Surprisingly, the tin ticket also became a story about the power of women's friendship to see us through the worst of times. Then there's Ludlow Tedder, whose sad story has a bittersweet ending. As a widow and mother of four children she didn't make enough to support them. She made the mistake of stealing eleven silver spoons, and a bread basket that she pawned as a means to send her youngest child Arabella to school. For her misdeed, Ludlow received a ten-year sentence. Arabella was transported with her, and Ludlow had to leave her other children behind, who she would never see again. Once in Van Diemen's land, authorities took children away from their mothers and placed them in an orphanage, because they wanted the children to be pure of their mother's sins. By the time she was freed, Ludlow had cleverly saved enough money to essentially buy Arabella back from the orphanage. They left Tasmania for the goldfields in New South Wales and went on to become respected property owners. Many of the convict women's descendants suffered from what they called the convict stain which described the social ostracizing that came with having convict heritage. However, revisionist history is starting to set the story straight. I am particularly intrigued by the convict maids, because women have been largely ignored in history as of the lives of the working class. I view the female inmates as heroic, because they triumphed over tragedy as their lives transformed from desperation and injustice to freedom alongside a new start in a new land. The miracle of their story is that the vast majority of these women went on to become loving mothers and grandmothers. They became the founding mothers of modern Australia and 22% of Australians today are descended from these remarkable convict women and men. And that my friends is the end of my little story. Thank you for watching, bye for now.